He was in jail for 24 hours there. They were saying, why are you going to Birmingham anyway? And he said, we need to take a stand somewhere that is so prominent of locking us up. When you look at the pictures and the video of the German shepherds that are running up and they're just tearing the flesh away. Young kids, you are. King went to the older folks first and said, come on and come on. And then the information started coming back. Well, I got to keep my job. The men were a little bit nervous because I got to still take care of the family. And by right, this is all you had. So if, if I don't work, then y'all don't eat and we all in trouble. But then it was the young people who said, well, I'm only in school. And the teachers were like, well, my job is to teach you and I need to be wherever you are so I can teach you. So if we all happen to be at the march, <laughs> class is still being in session. I'm your teacher and I am there. We all just happen to be on a field trip. <laughs> and it was the young people. That's why we are on you guys who are here today. And everybody in here, trust me, to them elders who were walking in the streets, you're the young people. We're the young people. And we have to let our young people under us know that that fight starts there. It's with you. And King noticed that while he had 11 days to sit in a Birmingham jail after he just got out of jail. You would say, don't you get it? They done already locked you up. And you went back to the same place to get locked up again. So I'm going to teach you 24 hours. Wasn't going to help you. Let's give you 11 days. And in the course of 11 days, the clergyman decided, we got a right king. You're supposed to be one of us. Wearing the collar, being in church on Sunday. That's the only time I really need to hear you to preach the word and then go home. And they wrote him a letter saying, why are you out here making all this noise, King? Why are you causing all of this trouble? You're a man of the cloth. You're a man of God. Stop causing this tension. And King sat there for 11 days and then he, not, then he started writing. But in the course of those 11 days and he read the letters of the men, he had to. He was conflicted. He had to write this letter back. And so what he did was he started to answer the letters of the clergyman. And when they called me, I was like, oh man, I'm not going to read that whole letter. We all be sleeping. <laughs> you don't mean to be sleeping. I get that. But I suffer from human ADHD. So I'm going to give you a good 15 minutes of what I got. And then after that, that's just me. Now it might be something you don't have to admit it, but I understand. But I wanted to pick out something real important of that. They asked King to wait. There is no time to wait. There is no reason that from the east side to the south side to the north side, to the west side, that we all come together. Young men who are being given drugs to subdue them and not giving them any kind of other hope but this drug to subdue them and then put them back on the street now without the drug to subdue them and you wonder why they go crazy. You wonder when a child screams for help and he has to go and shoot up a school and we wonder where that came from. Why young boys are on Twitter writing letters because they didn't fell in love and they never knew what love was and the only thing they could do now was write and shoot a video before they shot themselves. There's power in our people and we haven't tapped into it because so many people are telling us to wait. King said in any Nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustice exists. Negotiations. Self-purification. Direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gain saying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly 
segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unresolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case, and on the basis of this condition, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiations. Then last summer came the opportunity to talk with the leaders of Birmingham, its economic community, and in the course of the negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the stores, humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed for a momentarium on all demonstrations. And as the weeks and months went by, we realized that we have become victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed and then returned, and the others remained. And as so many past experience of our hopes had been blasted to the shadow of the deep disappointment settled upon us, we had no alternative except to be prepared for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscious. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence. We repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to accept blows? Without retaliating. Are you able to endure the ordeal of going to jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for Easter season, realizing that, except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, and we felt that it would be time to bring pressure, to bear on the merchants for a needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's morality election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action. When we discovered that the Commissioner of Police Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, had piled up enough votes to be in this demonstration, could not let that cloud the issues. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of the direct action. Nonviolent direction action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so drama, so much drama. The issue can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension at the part of the work of nonviolent register may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I'm not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of construction to Socrates. He says, just as Socrates felt necessary, nonviolent tension, which is necessary for growth. Then King to create tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myth and have truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolence. That applies to create the kind of tension and open the door to negotiation. And I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation 
Too long for our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I have, my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Hmm. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer I can give you in this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the ongoing and outgoing before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Boltwell as mayor will bring the millennium to the Birmingham. While Mr. Boltwell is a much more gentle person than Mr. Connor, they both are segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. And I have hope that Mr. Boltwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation. But he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights, my friends. I must say that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have not yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ears of every Negro piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see that one of our distinguished jurists, that the justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at a horse and buggy pace. Toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it's easy for those who've never felt the stinging darkness of segregation to say, wait. But when you've seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and your fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you've seen hate-filled police curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you've seen the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of the affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see the tears welling up in her eyes when she was told that Fun Town is closed to colored children. And to see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. And to see her begin to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for your five-year-old son who was asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in an uncomfortable corner of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother never given the respected title of Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, 
and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you go forever fighting a degenerate sense of nobodyness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to plunge into the abyss of despair. I hope you, sirs, can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. No time to wait. That was the king. There is no time to wait. When someone wants to come into disrespect and make light of the work that you have done, there is no time to wait. When you walk past and see those who you would love to help and know that you are in a government or in a society that has set you up to fail, there is no time to wait. It is time to put on all the armor of God, but importantly, the armor of God, you need to have a helmet and something to cross your chest to protect your mental and your heart. Because your mental will tell your heart with the love that we all must come together today. That you all have proven that there is no more time to wait. Thank you.